This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have Tony Scalzo of Fastball on the show. How you doing today, Tony? I'm doing good, thank you. You're back here in Orange County. You do reside in Austin, Texas, which is where all the music's happening right now. Uh, tell me what brings you out here to Orange for the week. Um, I'm playing a few shows. I'm kind of doing a little experiment to see uh, if I could rehearse a band without being around, like using the internet to, you know, get... I, I picked a couple of guys who I knew that I'd played music with before, but years, years ago, I mean really long time ago and uh hadn't played with him since hadn't really talked to him for you know maybe a couple of times here and there over the last 20 years and i just sent him mp3s and sent him charts and they learned the songs by themselves and then we got together for like you know a couple of nights at a rehearsal place down here in laguna hills and you know went at it and you know nailed it down and then we did a show last night in la at molly malone's and they pulled it off. They really did. And I think it's really, my experiment is a success because I think that what I learned was that you don't really need to have, you know, pro cats, you know, in your band, especially if you're worried about, you know how people get kind of cocky and they're just like, oh yeah, I got it, I got it. But then they get up and they don't really know. I got chord changes in my songs and uh, you kind of really need to learn them to play them, otherwise you're gonna make mistakes all over the place. And these guys, they learned it, and they, there was very few mistakes, and I don't think anybody in the audience noticed. Tell me about your, your early days here in Orange County. I really wanted to be in a lot of great Orange County punk bands. I mean, I have a lot of friends, you know, and I, I think I was just a little bit younger than some of the, you know, like Mike Ness and Jack Grisham, and those guys, they're all about four or five years older than me, and uh, I was always the little, you know, the little dude. I was really ambitious, and I really wanted to be a part of the thing, and I really wanted to be cool like, you know, all those guys and, and be in a band. And what's interesting is that I kind of shot myself in the foot. I started getting into the, you know, the drugs, and, you know, that's not, that's not an old, that's not some new story. I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, have come through that. Some people didn't make it, and some people are doing great now, you know, and, uh, so I got, you know, through that sort of phase or whatever, <laughs> lasted a little too long. And by the time I got done, I found myself in this great little scene in uh, Orange County in Costa Mesa where I was living. And there were a lot of sober people around there at the time too, you know. And, uh, you know, when you don't have drugs to do, it's like you start gravitating towards creative efforts and started really getting into music like 100%. And it was... It was amazing how things just started working, you know? All of a sudden, you know, you stop screwing around and things just start working. And I started playing with, you know, these guys who were younger than me, actually. Uh, Nick Schobeck and Nate Shaw and Jamie Reedling and Darren McNamee had a band called uh, Electric Kool-Aid. And Darren, I guess, was moving on to other things. He started playing, you know, Gherkin Ruckus and, uh, you know, and then they got signed and became extra large, do you remember that? Yeah. And uh, so they needed a singer and they, Nick called me up and I went down there and started, you know, auditioning and we just started going from there and sort of changed the course of that band, Electric Kool-Aid, from what was a sort of psychedelic punk band, which was sort of popular during that time, 87, 86, 87, right? So by 89, we were all, everybody was out of school, and uh, I started playing with those guys, and we turned into more of like a, I'd like to think it was more like a Stooges, MC5 kind of thing, and kind of a, you know, just getting back to the rock and roll thing, which was we thought was really what punk was about, was getting back to the rock and roll roots, and, you know, I really got into that for a while, and I, unlike the other front men of Electric Kool-Aid, whom coincidentally I believe... Uh, Mark McGrath was a singer f for a short time. Uh, everybody else was, you know, the mic guy, singer, front man. But, uh, you know, I wanted to play guitar, and me and Nate had a little guitar thing going where we worked together. So we kind of changed that a little bit. But that's where I really started writing, and, and writing for me to sing. And 
and I realized that it, it, it wasn't very hard for me to come up with these sort of dumb rock and roll songs, you know, and it, it just got, you know, mo I got more and more involved in that, and on the other hand, I also started playing on the side with other bands, and I got invited by Randy Bradbury, who's uh, now a longtime bass player, Pennywise. He was the bass player in Tender Fury with, uh, with Jack Grisham, original TSOL singer, and he invited me to join that band, and uh, we had a lot of fun. I mean, that was, to me, that was like the really, the big step up, and we were finally doing stuff where, you know, we had a little crew going. It wasn't like, a, you know, a pro crew, but it was friends, you know, and, and everybody helped each other out. We made it work, and we did really good shows, went out of town, and that's the first time I ever played out of state. We went to Phoenix and played a show, and I was just like, this is definitely what I want to do, you know, this is, this is my life. By, by that time, I think it was probably about 26 or 27. And I was in a relationship, and uh, she got pregnant. We had a baby on the way. So things started to get real complicated, and I was working full-time, delivering slabs of marble in a flatbed truck all over the state. And uh, that was interesting. Uh, but I was, you know, definitely putting in my hours and I'd get home and, you know, do the baby thing. And uh, but I got a call from uh, another local guy, guy who works with Dave Grohl right now, um, uh, Scott Parker. Mm -hmm. And he was working with uh, a label called Lightstorm Records, which is the at the time, this is like 90, 93, was James Cameron's music label. Uh, and he had Randy Gersten, who uh, was his musical director, who's the guy who pulled together all that Titanic music, right? He pulled that together, and he was also the label sort of head, right? For lack of a better term, he was the president of Lightstorm. And uh, so he had signed this Texas singer-songwriter, a young guy named Beaver Nelson, who needed a band. And... For some reason, they had this idea that if they hired a couple of guys from Orange County and put them with this Texas singer-songwriter who was influenced by, like, you know, Dylan and Towns Van Zandt and Steve Earle and all these, you know, sort of Americana guys, that somehow it would m turn into the replacements. And, that, and th this is literally what we were told, you know. And so we went along with it, and we went out there, Jamie and I, Jamie's, you know, one of the guys who was in Electric Kool-Aid with me, he and I moved to Texas with our families and our children. And we went to Texas, and we got there, and we couldn't believe how hot it was. And we also couldn't believe how, wow, there's a lot going on here. This is amazing. I mean, we were able to go see Bad Religion and Green Day, you know, at this, you know, this little club on a weeknight, you know. And all this stuff was happening there, and they have South by Southwest every year, sort of figuring out what that was all about. and But anyway, that project didn't really work out. Oh, and incidentally, Jamie, he bailed because he needed to surf and decided he had to get back to Orange County. <laughs> and so, um, but I I stayed, and I actually got remarried there. and Well, not remarried, but I got married and, you know, raised a family there. And um, not too shortly after that, Beaver Nelson thing fizzled out. That's when we started working with uh, me and the drummer from that band. Started the new drummer started working with uh, another guy named Miles Zuniga, and we started a little trio and went through various names and basically just started writing and recording and playing around town as as quickly as possible and uh, started getting a little notoriety and some of the local press started writing about us and one of the writers from the local magazine, sort of like our OC Weekly would be the Chronicle, the Austin Chronicle, Andy Langer also wrote for CMJ. So he did this great little blurb on us, uh, saying how we were bringing back, you know, this sort of, you know, real pure sort of pop rock thing, you know, which I don't think was really happening that much back then. I mean, there was Green Day, but it was more of a punk thing, and we were sort of like, you know, a little bit poppier, a little bit, you know. Granted, we were loud, we were fast, we played giant, huge, unnecessary amps, you know, and but and and as the years, you know, went by, we started trimming down to like 30 watt amps, and uh, anyway, uh, right away we started getting this attention, 
And next thing I know, we're playing a show at our local bar, The Hole in the Wall, right by the campus at UT. And in walks an old friend of mine from the Tender Fury days, Julian Raymond, who was an A&R vice president at Hollywood Records. And he came in with a guy named Rob Seidenberg who had come just to see us. Now, this is the funny thing is that Julian didn't know that I was in the band. But Rob had drug him to, to uh, Austin to go see this band. And then I see Julian in the club. I'm like, Julian, what are you doing here? He goes, oh, I'm here to see this band. And they're called Magneto USA. And I'm like, that's my band. And he's like, no way. <laughs> you know. So it didn't really take much, I think. I don't even think we were that good. But I mean, you know, I guess me knowing Julian and Julian talking to Rob and Next thing you know, Rob's like, okay, I want to sign you guys, you know. Um, we were going to go play in New York at CMJ anyway. And he says, great, I'll meet you at CMJ. I'll come see your gigs. And we had a good time up there in New York. First time I'd ever been there, you know, playing, got to play at CBGB's. And mm -hmm. it was just, you know, this great new world. And I started seeing how this is going to happen. And we had lunch with Rob Seidenberg, and he wrote down some figures on a napkin. And we we're just like, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this. And we got a manager, and we got a, a great manager from Atlanta, Georgia, who's uh, Sean Mullins' manager, Indigo Girls' manager, and uh, Matthew Sweet at the time was, and he put us on tour with Matthew Sweet. So Hollywood worked with Russell to get all that going. We went on the road, started garnering a really good national fan base the record didn't do so well but then we went in there and did another one and for some reason everybody you know latched onto this record and we had all of a sudden all these people from all these different labels we had you know mark didia and rob cavallo and bob wow. cavallo started you know bob cavallo became president of hollywood records at that time uh so we were like Really not sure what was going to happen when he took over, but he brought all these people in to work the record, and he goes, I'm, I'm telling you guys, you better get ready. You better get ready, because it's going to happen. And we're like, oh, what? <laughs> you know? Uh, radio, they just had all this, all this great stuff from all the different radio stations, and people were calling in, what's that song? What is that song? And next thing you know, we're number 19 on the Modern Rock chart. Then we're number, you know, 17. We're number. He goes, yep. Two more weeks, it'll be number one. That's what that's what Bob Cavallo said, and sure enough, it was knocked out. I smell sex and candy, right? Uh -huh. Lasted, times. yeah, lasted about six weeks on number one. Got knocked out by closing time, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Yeah, good, good <laughs> right? Yeah. So we were all over the place right about then, and it, it just really never stopped for three years that song the way you know really took off on radio and you know we were off to the races basically uh i got all kinds of feedback from people out on the road when i when i'd go down to like the south say we were playing in birmingham alabama or something these people would ask me you know what were my religious views really because they believed it was a faith-based kind of song you know <laughs> And in a way it is, you know, it's sort of about afterlife kind of thing, you know, it's like this couple who disappears and, you know, they've died, they've, they've crossed over. So it's, they don't have to worry about anything anymore and they'll never get old and, and they're together, you know, and that was, that's really the premise of the song. So, you know, it didn't, didn't, didn't really have any specific religious connotations or anything like that, but I definitely got, you know, a lot of that, which is, I believe why, uh, uh, some movie makers had approached me to do this sort of Christian movie, which ironically I didn't accept because the language was too strong. Yeah. I, you know, weird stuff. So essentially the way catapulted Fastball into million selling records. Yeah, definitely. If, if it weren't for that song, the other songs wouldn't have been, you know, put on the radio either. And we actually had a few other top 20 songs, You're an Ocean, mm -hmm. uh, Out of My Head, and Fire Escape. Uh, all you know, all did really well on the radio. You are a rock star now. What uh, happens to your mind? Actually, it was rough. It was it was difficult. I was 33, I think. I was already you know, I'd been around and I'd you know, I was married, 
uh, I tried as hard as I can to, you know, you know, you know, be in touch and be in my relationship, but my absence and, you know, our separation for such a long period of time and then the temptation of, you know, life, I, I, you know, I will admit and be honest that it wasn't, I wasn't up for it and I, and I, I screwed up and I messed up and it, it destroyed my marriage. It really did. Uh, it planted the, the bad seeds that later wrecked my marriage. It didn't ru- ruin it then. I mean, we tried really hard. I mean, we, we did all kinds of stuff, counseling, and, you know, she couldn't really handle it, and I couldn't handle her not handling it, and we just sort of drifted apart. We are friends still. We have two children together. Uh, they're, they're still children, you know. My, my daughter's 12. My son's 8. Uh, the daughter I had that we moved out with, she's 18 now. She's going to be 18 Sunday, because I'm sorry I'm going to miss your birthday. Happy birthday. I love you, Scarlett, but uh, I'll be back. And, uh, uh, you know, we're still friends, and she sort of understands now, but it it got crazy. I mean, uh, I started drinking heavily after being sober and clean for uh, about eight years or so. Uh, Out in Europe, you know, uh, I'm in Bavaria for Oktoberfest. It's like... (laughs) <laughs> you know, that looks good. Next thing I know, I'm dancing in Stockholm at some disco to Madonna. Do you feel that it was more about your surroundings or what, was it more about what's going on in here, in, in your heart? Combination of the two things and the schedule, just the, the gnarly work schedule. I mean, we would literally, we'd get four hours sleep a day and we'd even try to have fun and it was just like, I can't even... You know, I'm going to go to bed, you know, we try to party it out, but it doesn't work uh, all all the time. And, you know, we were going and doing a lot of radio and the, and the label was was, you know, they were relentless on us and the and management was relentless on us. And everybody who wasn't us, who wasn't flying around and who wasn't having to, you know, show up and do the thing and put on the smiles, uh, they were all pumping it and working us. And sure enough, when that whole thing started to taper off and we went in to go do our third album, support started dwindling and we found ourselves kind of like, fine, okay, that's how it is. You know, and they were telling, accusing us of not being marketable and we don't know what to do with you guys because there's no central front man in the band. Um, you know, we've always, Miles and I have always, you know, split the thing and I think that's what... You know, that's part of what we're all about. And I think that any of our hardcore fans, you know, they cite that, that there's much more going on than your average band. I mean, we got a lot of musical styles that we do. That's their perspective. I mean, these are industry people who've worked with many, many bands and many artists, right? So they see it as, you know, what the hell am I going to do with this band, you know? Uh, I, I need another song like The Way. And now how do you write another song like The Way without it sound like you're just trying to copy what you were doing before? We're into music, you know? We're into the Beatles, and we want to expand like the Beatles expanded. You know how they did? I mean, they yeah. went from, you know, She Loves You, Yeah, 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 to, you know, Strawberry Fields yeah. Forever in the course of three, four years. Yeah. Now, we, we weren't working at any different pace than they were. We had great resources, and we had fantastic musical people working with us. We, were, we had the ability to bring in Billy Preston to play piano. Wow. We had the ability to bring you know, Brian Setzer in to play you know, a solo, yeah. or you name it, tons of people, and great people. In fact, last night at our show at Molly Malone's, I was able to bring in Marty Rifkin, who's he's now uh, Glenn Campbell's steel player. But uh, he played the lap steel on Urine Ocean, which is all that, you know, that uh, that guitar solo on there. And and I got him in last night to play a couple of songs. It was amazing, you know. And it's when you get to work with these great musicians in a great studio like A&M Records, where the Carpenters recorded, where, you know, uh, they did We Are the World there. You know, why not exploit it musically and use it? Well, I, I got mariachis in there for a song. I had a full-on mariachi orchestra, and I'm telling these guys what to play, and it's just like my dream come true musically. Well, the label didn't see it that way. They saw it as, you know, you're just throwing our money away, and yeah. throwing, I like that, throwing our money away. But, um, you know, that's what happened. 
I was talking, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll move on in a second, but I was talking to a good friend of mine and a writing partner that I'm very honored to know, a guy named Big Al Anderson. Mm -hmm. He was in a band in the 80s called NRBQ. Okay. They were fantastic, amazing, monster of a band who could play any style. I mean, I mean any style, from jazz to straight up. I mean, the NRBQ stands for New Rhythm and Blues Quartet, okay? Al's an incredible writer. Musician, guitar player, singer. He wrote, he's written literally scores of hits that you wouldn't even know that he wrote. Like, he wrote, All you ever do is bring me down with the Mavericks, which is a number one crossover Americana country, you know, slash rock hit. And, uh, well, we were sitting around talking a couple weeks ago, writing songs in a hotel room. And, I was telling him how, you know, we're just, we just play all styles, you know, we play all kinds of music and that's what we want to do. And he, and I guess they didn't like that over at the record label. And he, he said, oh boy, that's a kiss of death, isn't it? Because that's exactly what happened to them 20 years before. You know, they had a little bit of a hit with me and the boys. You remember that song? How's it go? I think it's na 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 Me and the boys. Oh, yeah. Me and the boys. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, Good times. Right. Just like us, you know. And, um, but nobody's really heard of them. R.E.M. took them out for the Green Tour. I saw them at the Pacific Amphitheater. And the first time I ever saw NRBQ, and that was opening up for R.E.M. About 88. The funny thing about your, your albums is... Your first album, when you get signed, your first album is called Make Your Mama Proud. Right. Now, now let's just, now look, there's actually a story in your albums, just in the titles alone. The fact that all the pain money can buy is is the name of your your hit record. It, it is. All of them. And, all of them, exactly. It all actually tells a story, and the thing is, is that you're foreseeing. It's almost like you're setting the standard for for the future of the band at that point. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta come up with a really positive title for the next album. Like, I'm a winner. I'm gonna win. Yeah, I can feel it. Things are gonna change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the better. Don't just put things are gonna change for the better. It's true. I mean, I don't know why that is the way it is. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like that Spinal Tap the black album yeah. you know it's yeah. like and then it in that scene they show them looking at the album and there's a reflection of the drummer's face in the in the album cellophane and he's the one who blows up at the end right you know essentially the harsh light of day is your third album and that's the one where you re you guys decide to really experiment musically and the record company's not not having it yeah because they just couldn't find a, a hit on it i mean you're an ocean they, they really thought it might be but uh, you know, we spent a lot of money and we spent a really lot of money on the video, which is, you know, those days are over. Yeah. And I think we just got in at the very last little bit of that, you know, major label throwing the money at you and they don't do that anymore. How do you get away from Hollywood records and then join and then get on Ryko? That was great. That was, you know, sort of faded. Uh, we... Managed to just get off. We just got our manager to get us a release, and it was no problem, and there's no conflict or anything. Um, the label wasn't really willing to do, you know, any more work with us. They were moving towards uh, fluff pop, as you so aptly put it. By the time you guys are successful, Britney Spears and, and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, they are the biggest thing in the world, Eat all the way through the thousands. Actually, that was they were sort of on the wane, too, those, those actual artists that you're naming. Christina Aguilera was sort of coming up, Pink, yeah. people like that. Uh, we actually did tons of shows with bands like that. We did all these radio shows. When you have a radio hit, you go and do giant radio shows and we would play with Britney Spears and we would play with NSYNC and 98 Degrees and Mariah Carey and you know and the guys you know all those biker crew guys with the beards and they'd be sitting there on the on the cases and they'd go what the hell are you guys doing here you know because we'd have real amps and guitars and a drum set yeah. and all these other acts would have like you know hit play Let's go, right? And uh, it was a trip, and it was a drag musically. 
I mean, we were able to sometimes go out to some clubs and see bands, but, you know, it was it was all work and no play, really. And the only play you got was destructive play, you know, because it's like, I'm in a bar or I'm in a casino, and it's like, what else you do, you know? Well, what kind of long-term benefits did having a million selling record benefit you up to the time that we are together interviewing today right i'm still i'm still finding that out i'm still learning because it's very difficult uh when you you know when you're a grown up and you have a family and i do live a very you know normal kind of life other than you know i i play a lot of music but i you know i got kids around and i'm dealing with their problems and you know uh keeping the house up and making minor repairs and getting the car oil changed, all that stuff, it uh, makes you forget. So when you do go out on the road, all of a sudden you're, you know, and I forget that sometimes if I'm playing a show, let's say I'm playing a show where uh, people have actually come to see us and I might come around the corner and I realize I'm going to have to get stopped by all the, and I get, and I do get stopped and they want to talk and they want to, and I'm like, oh, I wasn't ready for that, you know. So uh, you forget what actually you've done and what, you know, the way people see you. So, I mean, I'm trying to figure out ways. And I'm, I'm actually learning as an older person to stop and be quiet and listen, right, and find out what it is I'm supposed to do. And <clears throat> basically, I think I'm just supposed to work. I'm just not supposed to slack off. I'm really just supposed to stay at it uh, and steer myself towards, you know, uh, just be on that path. I'm not talking about a goal or anything. I would like to find, you know, set some little goals, like go to California, play three shows, you know, and then, you know, promote myself a little bit so I can go home and, you know, and start working on my album and know that I got something to work for and it's all good, you know? What is what? Just going back to to the to the success period where you're just a you know million selling success. What what do you think was the biggest extravagance that you kind of splurged on during that period? Wine. Really? Yeah. Huh. I, I would go to uh, Central Market or Whole Foods. I remember once we left on a tour with the Goo Goo Dolls. We were uh, we were on this you know huge yeah. huge bus and. We got a crew. There's like 11 of us on a bus with a trailer behind it, and and we're uh, stopping. the 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 driver says, "Okay, well, we're on our way out. We're gonna probably we're heading out to Phoenix, I guess." He goes, "I got to stop at the supermarket for some supplies," and I go, "Stop at Whole Foods, right?" Okay, we stop at Whole Foods. I get a cart, and I literally I spent seven hundred dollars on wine. And put it all in the in the bus and it wasn't a lot of bottles you know what i'm talking i'm saying it's yeah, like 75 dollar bottles of wine i'm going crazy and i don't do things like that now no. i drink i don't spend <laughs> you know i don't spend a lot of money i'm a you know i'm a harp pine a harp guy you know yeah. at this point and my wife just won't have it you know she's like nah you know yeah. Well, that's why you need the wife. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. It's a lifesaver. I'm telling you, man. She really helps me put things in perspective. My wife didn't know who I was or what I did when I met her. We were introduced by mutual friends, and she was just, you know, asking her friend if she knew any guys because she was trying to, you know, get something going. <laughs> and, uh, happened to me. Oh, yeah, good, yeah. good. Well, it works, you know. Yes. Briefly tell me about your time with Social Distortion. I was never in Social Distortion. But, you were, but there's a picture of you actually playing yeah, on that, stage. That's a one-off thing that Mike... Mike was doing a, uh, uh, a solo acoustic... Or not acoustic, but a solo rock thing for a... Uh, it was a benefit or something for somebody at Night Moves in Huntington Beach, which is no longer there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and... He just needed somebody to play really quick, and he even approached me like that morning and said, hey, do you want to do this thing at Night Moves? And I said, sure, you know, what are we going to do? He goes, oh, you know, like oldies. We did a bunch of oldies. We did like Chuck Berry and Johnny Cash, and, and I could do that stuff, you know. I've been able to do that stuff all my life yeah. for some reason. And so uh, we did it, and Mitch Dean, who was the current 
GSOL drummer, at, you know, or at the time, he played drums, and we just did it. We just played for like 45 minutes, and my sister was there with a camera, so it's it's awesome. And you know, my, Mike was a a local, kind of locally pretty pretty famous, you know. Nothing like now. I mean, it turns out, you know, through perseverance and, you know, sticking to your guns, Social Distortion is now one of the biggest American rock bands, you know, there is. We got released from Hollywood, and we continued as a band just playing gigs here and there. But uh, I was doing some stuff on my own. I was starting to record on my own and write on my own, and I also joined another band. I joined this rock band that got all this attention in England called the Young Heart Attack. They got signed to uh, uh, some big label in England, and they brought a producer over, and we started recording, and, you know, it was going okay, but things started getting real, real industry, you know, and I started smelling how things were about to stop being fun, and so that's when I decided to start talking to Miles, and let's start working on new material, and and we did, and I told him, you know, I'm going to have to move on. Joey actually stayed on for a long time, and he went to Europe, and they toured with Motorhead and The Darkness and did all the big metal festivals, actually, which is something that, I mean, I would have loved to have been there because that's really the world I come from. I come from Donington. I come from Deep Purple, you know, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, you know. That's really, you know, and as much as I loved you know, punk and hardcore here in, you know, California. Man, I would have loved to have been on those stage at, yeah, the, at those yeah. racetracks, you know, and they got to do it. But meanwhile, Miles and I were working on music, and w it turns out that Rob Seidenberg, the guy who had signed us to Hollywood, had moved over to and to Ryko, and he signed us. So that's kind of, you know, doesn't happen too often. Same A&R guy, different label, same band. We got signed to Ryko. We made a really good record, in my opinion. We made it all in Austin. We used all the good musicians we could think of in in Austin, and you know, in a great studio. And the record came out, and it was great. And we got all these awesome reviews, and it was the press. The press really dug it, you know. And the label uh, decided to go back to being what it was, really. They were going to be a, a new artist kind of label, but I guess they looked at the books and said, you know, that's like, you know, suicide. Yeah. Let's just keep selling, you know, Frank Zappa, blah, 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 you know, and which is, that's why we really wanted to be in the label because, wow, great company, you know, wow. Elvis Costello and, oh, man, it just goes on forever. I mean, there's so many great acts on that on that you know catalog how do you come to start your own label and put out little white lies well we knew i mean that that it can be done we started you know thinking of names for the label so we've settled on 33 and a third records which is so crazy because you would you'd think that it'd be taken and no it wasn't so we got that you know we got that name and um we got a distributor there's tons of companies that you know, can put out your record and do all the things that the label would have done. Uh, meanwhile, you're sort of like, you know, it's all in-house, so you don't have to, there's no, you know, recouping, and uh, we took out a, um, a credit card account for the recording, and then we took out a credit card account for, oh, paid it back by the gigs we were playing, and, uh, and then took out another one for some more promotion, and you know, and the mix, and we got Bob Clearmountain again to mix the record. He actually record he uh, mixed our uh, our uh, Ryko record, and that's how we got a relationship with Bob. And you know, he's fantastic. He's done everything for the last 40 years. That almost every hit, especially the California hit records. You know, wh when I say that, I mean songs that you hear in California regionally, like. Those are like Jackson Brown, yeah. like Roxy Music, Avalon. He uh -huh. did that. He did Tattoo You by the Stones. Wow. He did a bunch of Stones records. Wow. Um, you know, so awesome to work with him. And um, but after, but after that, and that is that is a success for you guys. Yes, yeah, uh, this, is, this is sort of post-success success where you start realizing what the real success is, not the money thrown 
success, you know, where the label just pumps money into yeah. what's going on. It's the success that you create on your own with your own capital. Pay it back, pay back your debts and start earning, you know. Um, and, uh, well, we were all in-house and we decided to go and start touring. We did okay touring on our own. Uh, I think we made a mistake by uh, going out with Sugar Ray um, back in uh, uh, July and August of last year because, uh, I mean, it was, it was, you know, nice to be with them again. They're our friends and everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Sugar Ray tour didn't take in the money it was supposed to. We weren't really getting paid what we need to get paid to be out, and so we lost a lot of money. However, we got off of it off of that tour, took a little break, and we started doing one-offs. We got a new booking agent, and we do, like, one-offs at colleges where we fly in or, you know, city community, you know, things, and we'll get good fees for that. So we're able to do one-offs and get, and get good money. And we actually, this year, 2010, we had our best year ever since back in the Hollywood days. So, I mean, you know, it just... Depends how you play the game, you know, and we made a couple of wrong moves and this time we've made a few right moves Let's fast forward to 2010 and you are working as a solo artist now. Tell me uh, How that came to be and what are your hopes and dreams as a solo artist? Um, well Fastball got off the road a couple weeks ago basically from you know pretty active year Miles Zuniga other guy, he says, I'm going to work on a solo album, and he's got it, you know, all figured out how he's going to do that, and I started thinking, well, you know, if we're not going to be working, and if you're going to be doing that, I'm going to I'm gonna try and do something too, and uh, so I've been working on material, I just want to, you know, compile a, probably about 30 songs, I've, I'm almost there, actually, I'm doing pretty well, and then, you know, the guys that I want to work with, and trying to figure out who, uh, or where to go to do it, you know, and I'll do it in Austin, too. Um, I have lots of resources at my disposal. So it's, and that's another, that's another indicator of real success, too, is the people who really want to work with you, you know? Mm -hmm. There's people that I admire that all I have to do is ask, and they will work with me, and I love that. Um, so i got to figure out all that. I want to use everybody. I can't use everybody. But, I, you know, I want to really make it, you know, something that's really good and really impactful and have story behind it, something to talk about. Is this going to be a different direction than fastball musically? I wouldn't say so. Okay. <laughs> as much as I'd love to say, oh, yeah, it's a new direction for me, you know, it's, you know, I do what I do. I'm a songwriter, and I love, I love all types of music, but I also sort of gravitate to a certain, a certain way of you know, musical expression, and it's kind of the, the verse, chorus, bridge, solo yeah. thing, you know, and I just love that. It's all about the hook, it's all about the melody, and it's all about the, the drum beat. And, I, and that's what I'm doing, and that's what it's going to be like. And hopefully there'll be a bunch of catchy tunes on there that people go, you know, this is great, I love this, you know. I'm addicted to that record. When can people, when can people maybe get their hands on your solo record? Oh, well, at first it has to be... It has to be recorded, <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm actually projecting a you know uh, a release around the summertime of next year. Cool. Mm -hmm. Tony Scalzo, it's been great Blair, having you on the Blaring you. Out with Eric Blair show. Thank Blair. you. Anytime. All right, Blaring Out with Eric Blair show with Tony Scalzo of Fastball signing off. The Blaring Out show.